How, I once put it this way. The Air Force baked it, the press served it, and the public ate it. That's really what happened. Uh, the Air Force was able to provide a ready-made explanation. It's not that anyone really believed it, anyone who thought about this believed it, but, but what they discovered is they don't need to have everyone believe everything to get their story through. If you've got the major media working on your behalf, and they did, they absolutely did, they were able basically to make it stick and just to make most people think, oh, okay, they explained it as weather phenomenon, nothing to get worked up over. Like they knew that the New York Times and they knew the Washington Post would always be there to do their bidding. That was all, that's always been the case. Um, and so that's what happened here. Now, behind the scenes, totally different story. Behind the scenes, we know through declassified literature that conversations continued and that furthermore, it was, it was widely stated within Air Force Intelligence and within the CIA that no one was really taking this weather explanation seriously. So that, that was a given. And that's what we really, you know, we learn when we look into this UFO phenomenon is that the public version and the classified version are, are currents that flow in different directions. They're not the same. And the, but at the beginning, the media fueled the hysteria, right? They were like, UFOs over the Capitol. Where were some of the headlines? Well, saucers swarm over Capitol. Jets indeed. chase DC sky ghosts. Is that, is that true? It is absolutely true that the media during this period of time covered this subject very extensively. And we have to keep in mind, media were much more independent at that time than they are today. Vastly more. Uh, there wasn't the kind of consolidation of major media that has taken place since that time. So newspapers were independently owned, and they actually were genuinely competing with each other to get scoops and to get information. So uh, it's a totally different situation today, of course. Back then, they were actually genuinely trying to scoop each other, and they couldn't afford to leave an explosive story like this alone. They wanted to get the readers. So there was definitely this kind of media uh, feeding frenzy that contributed to it. But it has to be said, they were working off of genuine actual reports and not just over Washington. In the summer of 1952, Project Blue Book was overwhelmed with reports from all over the country. They couldn't keep up. They had over 500 reports that single month of UFOs. They had no chance of being able to investigate more than a handful. Uh, and, you know, June was close to that amount, and August was close to that amount. It was an intense period. So, yes, flying saucers were on, uh, they were a major part of the news of that year. That's great. Um, I'm sure cross them off. Uh, so, Rappel, he... Uh, he interviewed the air traffic controllers when he got into town. Is that what he did? Yes. Yeah. Edward Ruppel did uh, uh, quite a few interviews of uh, military personnel in D.C. at the time. Certainly the traffic controllers, and you know, put together the investigate and put together the investigation he was able to put together. Um, his conclusion is that he certainly did not conclude that this was weather phenomenon. I think that's fair to say, and you can read this. Uh, just a few years later when he writes his book called Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, an excellent book, and he gives a very good overview of what he called the Washington merry-go-round. I didn't know that came from him. Yeah, that's, that's cool. his title. I didn't, that's awesome. Mm -hmm.